Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you had a fine lunch. I certainly did. And it is amazing to be back together and learning about some of the great discoveries and um, enthusiasm for Fife and its archaeology. Um, this talk's quite personal for me because I'm presenting a project that was the last piece of work I did as North Light Heritage uh, and before I started in a role recently as the Director of Archaeology Scotland. So it, it's the last project of one chapter uh, before this new one as I present with the Archaeology Scotland perspective. The other dimension that's quite personal is because Inverkeithing is where some of you all know who I've been working with, uh, where I went to high school and where I learned and where I was almost, cover your ears if there's any teachers here, uh, almost put off history but actually came back to the fold and I'm deeply passionate about. And the site I'm going to talk about, I have to confess I knew nothing about. I knew, didn't understand the importance of the town, its heritage. So it's a great joy going back many, many years later to see what the community have been doing, to see what those partners, uh, organisations and funders have been doing to really help make a difference through heritage. So it also represents something that we all um, struggled with. This happened during lockdown and the adjustment to it. So that will be part of the things I draw about the importance of heritage and why it matters to us at this time and why archaeology and participation in archaeology matters to us at this time. So I'll give a little bit of background. We'll look at the archaeological results, and I hope you'll find them interesting. They are significant. And I've just got some hot news from Derek Hall as well about one of the finds, which I'm so excited about. Where is he? Yes, brilliant. I'll tell you about that. And there'll be a little bit of reflection the way I'm talking. So as has been mentioned, this was part of a wider heritage initiative um, led by Five Historic Buildings Trust, uh, running for five years and is designed to help deal with some of the kind of key historic buildings in, in the Keething, uh, which is a borough, a royal borough. Um, its origins are slightly opaque, but um, it's clearly quite early. And as well as improving uh, access and use of those key buildings, there's also wider public realm, improving the streetscape, um, improving uh, interpretation around about that streetscape, and then also through the other outreach projects and activities looking to develop skills and capacity in the community. And one of the groups we worked very closely with and benefited from their knowledge and passion was in the Keeping Local History Society, uh, many of whose members participated in the projects and the different sub-projects of it. And even very early on, uh, I started to get really excited about the stories of the town and the way that people really came through on the left-hand side, as you're looking at, in the costume, or uh, uh, rather uniform, is Samuel Grieg, uh, uh, one of the more famous uh, uh, you know, uh, members of the town's community who ultimately went off to work for Catherine the Great. And the quarries of Inverkeithing ultimately built some of the harbors in the Baltic on Kronstadt. So there's a kind of an archeology span even in the way that the exchange and trade that came through the Firth of Forth and across the Baltics uh, emerged as a very exciting area of interest in terms of research and the community were interested in it. And there was a launch event um, quite early on where we reached out uh, within the title of the kind of overarching project title, People Making History. It was the idea that there were stories of people in the past that through the different projects we were gonna run, we would learn more about, tell their stories, but also as a community borough um, survey project in the fine and long tradition of community borough surveys uh, that have been delivered across Scotland, but very many significant ones in Fife over the past 20 years or so, uh, largely with the support of Fife Historic Buildings Trust, means that this was something we knew how it can animate the voices in the community. And the project had been planned already to have that oral history side of things. Uh, I'll come back to a very high level of that and to build skills and capacity around archive and documentary research. We were also doing uh, two standing building surveys, one of the townhouse, which we'll see some images of, and one of the Friary Hospitium building. So that uh, buildings and archeology span was a key part of actually getting people to think about the approaches, the techniques, and again, how the above ground stories and remains related to a range of other deposits we would be investigating. So it built, it built a space for conversation and ultimately that wonderful animated space of the community dig. So, 
We had planned it out beautifully. It was going to run just over a few months. And then, as you can see, shortly after our townhouse standing building survey, everything unraveled, and we had to adjust and respond. And I think it's important I give you this context because it continued to resonate through the work we did for the past few years, and I'm sure it's affected all of us in different ways, personally and profoundly. Um, and to acknowledge that, I think, is important because the community did rally around and try and make things happen. And those from Pipe Historic Buildings Trust, uh, the team there, have been very supportive in terms of ensuring that we could keep the momentum going and be adaptive. So we did manage before lockdown to do the first building survey, which relates to um, Inverkeepers Townhouse. I'm not going to get into details as such, other than that analytical process of looking at the building and revealing, revealing hidden secrets and stories uh, really excited more interest amongst volunteers and members of the community. Um, it is currently undergoing uh, significant um, works to um, modernize it and to improve accessibility of the building uh, and I think a renewed and refreshed chapter of its long and complex history will be revealed. But in that torchlit glow there, we were finding uh, in the core of the tower where we know the earliest phase of the building is, those archaeological buildings traces um, which uh, took us back to almost the very foundations of the building. And the picture up in the, the, the top right hand corner is a very early photograph from Dr. Keith, uh, probably from something like 16, 17, 1860, uh, which just again, to have that kind of photographic archive and resource for the town has proved to be very important in different ways. And as I said, then COVID hit and we had to adapt. So like many groups and many organizations, we quickly learned about Zoom and Teams. We quickly learned about the potential through the support of our the project's um, historian, Dr. Tom Turpey from the University of Stirling, who helped develop a range of individual and group thematic research projects, really kept that uh, skill and that expertise being shared amongst the broader team of volunteers. And there were a range of thematic projects we developed that individuals or groups of individuals would take place. Uh, there was an interest, perhaps understandably, in plague and the story of plague in Scotland and Fife, and there were significant stories to be told and discovered. There was also projects looking at work that was being undertaken and supported around about the transcription of an archive of largely 16th and 17th, 16th and 17th century documents that were related to the townhouse, but also other online documents that are available through Scottish archives. So one volunteer in particular spent a lot of time transcribing and making sense of 16th and 17th century women's wills. So again, people making history to give the voice to the voiceless or to represent something about the way that women adapted uh, in the 16th, 17th century was a very powerful uh, approach and, and, and Anne continues to champion that area of research. We had others looking at historic maps. We had others looking at trade records in relation to the sound toll records that can be found online in relation to trade going to Denmark and other parts of the Baltic. And as well as we understood making a huge contribution to how we were all feeling and dealing with things at that time, uh, there was some digital skills and capacity building, which again is a legacy of the project. And I can't stress enough how Emma Griffiths, uh, in particular at this time, helped us produce a range of pod podcasts, adapt and, and, and modify our approach. And we continue to work with Emma and greatly value the support she continues to give. So, nearly at the excavations, don't worry. And just to give you a flavour of some of those historical resources we were looking at, I'm not talking in detail, but inevitably we got drawn into the story of the Lazaretto on the bay of Inverkeithing, a, a remarkable account of somebody who lived there as a boy in the 19th century, uh, one of only two known Lazarettos as far, as far as I'm aware, the other one being formerly on Danoon, and actually at one point there was lots of discussion about could that be the community dig. It might be nice to revisit at some point. The oral history focused largely on this one here. We have the paper mill and Ward's uh, breaker's yard, which the noise still resonates across the, um, the harbour and across the town at times. And there was a wonderful oral history project that captured the voices of people who worked 
in both of those. And so again, the social history of industry was very important. And then down here, those historic maps gave us other insights uh, about that trade and relationship. You can see, unfortunately, uh, in the key thing, in terms of the Roy's map has been slightly bifurcated here, so it's not easy to see, uh, but that townscape of that Y shape has been effectively the, the Burgle town that had been set out and the rude strips uh, you know, uh, running down towards the harbour side here, running in the sort of uh, northwest to southeast direction. And that's what we're going to look at soon here. This little fragment is a letter uh, from a bone mill in, uh, owner in Inverkeething who was importing tons of bones from Denmark. I mean, just the stories kept growing and extending. And thankfully, uh, we were uh, uh, commended uh, as a, a community archaeology project in 2021 for the Marsh Awards, and it was in recognition of all the hard work of those volunteers, how they adapted, and how Fife Historic Buildings Trust team supported that change and that transition from a project that was meant to be very short and focused to a prolonged period of digital support and training. Now, to the excavations. This is a picture from one of the Valentine's photographs, probably from the late 1930s, which shows the Friary Gardens as was laid out as a public green space. The definitive history of Inverkeething by the Reverend Stevens um, is written by one of the great heritage champions of Inverkeething. He's researched meticulously the story of the Hospitium and the wider parish and the borough. But he also was responsible, integral, into encouraging the borough fund, the community fund, to purchase the building at this time and go through a restoration project. So the grounds here we see, this open space, is still maintained to this day and a, a, a much used and loved space in Inverkeithing in different ways. And down here, somebody is standing taking this photograph, perhaps Mr. Valentine himself, I don't know, uh, on, above the vaults, which we'll see, and these girls are sitting within a series of cellars that we will uh, explore in more detail. And just to give you, this is the kind of commission inventory plan. This is the Hospitium building itself. Uh, this is where the adjacent buildings were demolished, and this is the cellars that Valentine was standing, taking a photograph across in that direction. And we'll come back to that later. Now, the works were comprehensive. As you can see here um, from the sequence of images from the 20s through to the late 30s, a number of the four stairs were removed. I apologize for the size of this, but it allowed you to get the contrast. And that streetscape was modified quite significantly. And to the rear of the building, the Hispitium building, the Hispitium, I should add, was probably where in the Franciscan friary that those guests on the Pilgrim Way would have been given accommodation. It was like an inn, and they would stay there and potentially receive food there. And the fact that that very significant kind of public space still stands to this day is in no large part through, and no small part rather, through the work of Stevens and the Ministry of Works uh, restoration project. But as you can see, the restoration changed uh, a, a, a building that had these rectangular windows to something of a um, a pastiche of what they thought a medieval building should look like. Most of these are not authentic. Most of these are just inserted to give the appearance of a medieval building. They're not in the correct position from what we can tell. And to keep things focused, we did the standing building survey, and it is a complex building, but just to give you a sense of the interior, we have these beautiful vaulted, barrel vaulted um, ground floor rooms, uh, there's three of them in the ground floor. This is the main one that may have well been where food was served to people. And in the corner here, we have an insertion of a new and spiral staircase that took you up and through to another building as well, adjacent to it. But the most important thing I'd point out here is the complexity of this uh, gable with the different roof lines. Uh, this ragged line here is where there was another building abutting it and cut into the face. And this number 41, I think it is here, this, this thinner line here, is where this coping stone is actually set into it. So what we think we saw from the building survey is that the original tenement houses that stood there in about 1346, when we know from historical references the friars were allowed to use those tenements, the core of some of those parts of those tenements are preserved in the Hospitium 
as it was modified and changed by the latter part of the 14th century when uh, they were given consent and support to lay out a friary complex in a more formal arrangement. So it's amazing to see, it's not unequivocal, but it's amazing to see that that may be preserved in the current building. There may be something pre-friary preserved in the fabric of that building. There had been investigations previously in 2018 as part of another project uh, with the launch of the Fife Pilgrim Way. Uh, and appropriately, uh, we can see in the bottom left-hand corner here, Liz, who is the acting chair of in the Keeping Local History Society, uh, currently getting stuck in with a mattock, I think the technical term is. And we did establish, and this work was led by um, Ali Beckett of North Light Heritage at that point, um, and we did recover in this trench here the tops of an amazing wall line. At that time, that was all that could be done. I would also point out in this corner here um, the demolition of mortar and a series of oyster shells. The deposits above that wall, that robbed out wall top, are quite interesting, quite significant. There was a series of research questions that wanted to clarify to what extent that wall continued, to what extent did, uh, were there other um, deposits or remains potentially associated with what we would think would be a cloisters there, uh, that the, the arrangements of buildings would be set around, and what was the potential for archaeological preservation at depths that were, uh, you know, probably quite significant. Um, we benefited hugely from the help and support of local volunteers. It was all about trying to get people involved. We benefited hugely from the support and help of members from Fafan. Uh, I know a few of you are here today, and it was an absolute joy to get to know you and work with you. Unfortunately, there was another COVID twist. Three days before I was meant to start running the project, I, I, yeah, I got COVID. And I had to ask the help of uh, one of our former colleagues, uh, Dave Snedden from Clyde Archaeology, to run the project for the first week before I tested negative. So again, even a few days later, years later from the initial impact, it was still affecting us. And I owe a great thanks to Dave and to Emma as well from Fife Historic Buildings Trust for responding and modifying how we were working to, to deal with those realities. Um, but we did get some really interesting results. Uh, and just to orientate you, that's the Hospitium building there. These are the ruinous vaults. Uh, the, the upstanding vaults are here, which you'll see uh, perhaps later. This is the main trench we opened, Trench 5. I'll not talk about Trench 6. I'll briefly let you see Trench 7, Trench 8, and Trench 9 we'll have a look at. But the main trench, the main energy went into Trench 5. And I would love to say we had time to hand dig everything down to that level. But because of the insights we've got from the previous evaluation, we knew that it would be appropriate with the um, consent of the five county archaeologists to machine those levels off. Uh, because we were only going to get down to significant archaeology. And I'm not saying the remains on, uh, uh, above didn't have any significance, but I'll explain briefly. That topsoil deposit there was probably built up and laid out in the 1930s as part of the, 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 the groundworks to create that public space. The deposits that we machined down to the top of, of we know post-date the robbing out of the friary buildings and the friary walls, and are probably 18th, 19th century. Um, and they are jammed, packed full with bone, ceramics, and um, shells, substantial amounts of oyster shells, which again shows probably mid into that backyard uh, when the, uh, you know, the, the space was still being used. We recovered representative samples of those, and they will be assessed. You can see already, though, those archaeological remains coming up. Um, the robbed out base of uh, the wall line, which you can see already doesn't orientate with the stone we have here. But in this corner here, we do have the wall. Now, whether that is a gap that was there because it was an aperture, a doorway, a vaulted arch, or some um, differential preservation, we don't actually know as yet. We had to start working on sondages just for the time that was available, um, just to really target the information. And in this case, Donna spent a lot of time untangling this rather complex sequence of deposits, which is effectively what you're seeing here is the infill of the robber trench for taking the, robbing the wall out. 
Uh, and that was great. Uh, and just at this point here, we have a harder packed surface that looks like it was the level that was the, uh, the contemporary with the use of that building. And again, we didn't have time to investigate it. We've just established there's a significant horizon archaeologically, and that's a great step forward. But as you can see, it's slightly untidy here. Uh, and, and one of the things I'll point out in the next slide as well is that, actually, no, that's better in this one. You'll see this red deposit here, and you can see the way that there's not a, a clear cut here. Basically, what's happened is that after the building was um, abandoned, they infilled, or there was a collapse of burnt door and timber. We've just got a clue of this. And then after the stone was robbed out and the mortar was put back in, the, the edge of the robber trench has collapsed in. So there's hints that there is a timber phase, timber and door phase to some building on the site at this location. It's not entirely clear when or what building, but it may be, uh, it's a really significant clue. And as you can see in this section here, the wall line which runs in the next part of the trench I'll show you, um, actually was preserved to a very significant extent. This is looking from above. Um, and at this point here, the real bonus we had was the edge of the trench line here just, just, just allow us to discover a cross wall coming across. And while we are only seeing glimpses now, this is the really kind of the most fine keyhole archaeology, we know within the interior, this is about a depth of 1.4 metres now, and we really uh, couldn't go any further than that, we came down on rubble. We came down on some infilled rubble, possibly a phase of demolition of the building or collapse of the building before the walls were robbed out. And those walls are likely to have been robbed out in the 18th or 19th centuries from what we can see. So it was wonderful to get a cross wall relating to what might be the larger building. Trench seven, very briefly, we went down as deep as we safely could at that point and hit no in situ archeological deposits. And from cross correlating what we've had in other trenches, any archeological deposits, and they are likely to be there, are potentially about two meters or more down. So it's a really kind of significant opportunity to, um, if somebody in due course wanted to, uh, to investigate uh, further details. One point, though, at the time period we were excavating um, some of the finds here, we could see there was a kind of demolition layer in here as well. There was some, some dumping taking place with animal bone and oyster, the same sort of materials, but uh, an earlier phase of it than we've seen higher up in the sequences. That was where we found the star find that uh, Derek has just looked at. He has confirmed it is a piece of glazed floor tile and possibly, don't publish this anywhere, anybody, possibly Dutch. And that is amazing. And it might, again, correlate to the idea of what was this part of the building being used for. Well, let's have a think about that in a minute. We're going to go down to the other end, though. Uh, we're going to go down to the cellars where John spent a lot of time tirelessly excavating within this uh, vaulted cellar. Uh, I promised Julie uh, another oven today. We think this is probably an oven built into the cellar. And you can see again that this uh, vault would come over here like this. And we just really wanted to understand what the archaeological potential was in this area. And quite briefly, John's effort of systematically excavating this rubble infill, which is probably relates to the restoration or tidying up of this in the 1930s, and then it was leveled off, was packed full of bone, packed full of oyster shell, packed full of sherds of pottery. So it looks like they've dug out archaeological deposits and infilled them again as part of the restoration. It's become mixed up. But he did come down in this amazing mortared horizon, which we think on balance is probably uh, predates those restoration works. It is unlikely they laid down, I would argue, a mortar floor in the 1930s. So this may be one of the original interior surfaces uh, relating to the use of these vaulted cellars. Outside, at the very sort of furthest extent, there was this uh, feature up against uh, an outer wall. And it was just quite a simple exercise of saying, has this been some sort of decorative embellishment in the 1930s to make it look more medieval? Or is this an authentic feature? Is this an authentic potential buttress? And as you can see, what we have is something extended about half a metre into the ground, and it was set into a rock cut, almost step. It also has a kind of channel that was cut, very shallow, 
just maybe enough to give, either from quarrying rock out or potentially a channel that was actually about to making sure water didn't get backed up in there in some way. So it does seem that that is an authentic buttress. You wouldn't go to the trouble of kind of setting it in that way in the 1930s. You just want to have something decorative. And again, it implies that that building was several stories high potentially at that point. So I'll try and briefly sum up because I know my time is nearly done. This is an image uh, courtesy of Douglas Spears. It's the first iteration, and it just gives you a sense of the scale of the complex. That's the hospitium. Our trench was approximately in here, probably picking up the, uh, uh, the inner wall of what is likely to be the location of the church. Typically, at that north side would be where the church would be, uh, and, and we, we think that may be the case. And having that decorated tile from that location may support that um, hypothesis. Uh, but what I want to let you see there is the scale of the operation and the scale of how this uh, fell away, this ground fell away to the harbour. Uh, this is uh, where the paperworks was and it was uh, infilled and built up uh, uh, as they were built. But, so it was very close to the shore, it was very close to the trade, and it was a very important site in the context of Keith and Fife more broadly. So finally, very briefly, because I know I've taken too much time, it has been so important during lockdown and all the struggles we've had to continue projects like this. The community engagement has been amazing. We hope that the ongoing work of Fife Historic Buildings Trust and the other projects continue to build capacity around heritage and archaeology, and we've shown there is significant preservation at the site. But it's really appropriate that that is continuing a tradition that Stevens and others have had of caring for that green space, and long may it continue. A quick thanks to our funders. It couldn't be possible without, uh, in particular, National Lottery Heritage Fund and Historic Environment Scotland. And once again, thanks to all the volunteers and helpers. Thank you.